Today's presentation is a return of results session presented by Levo Therapeutics, and Davis Ryman from Levo will be sharing results from their phase three study of carbatosin. Davis, we're ready for you. All right, so um, I'd like to thank uh, Susan and the FPWR very much for, for um, all of their help throughout um, planning for and executing the study and for inviting us to present uh, today. So um, I'm very happy to be able to present um, the top line results from our phase three study of um, intranasal carbitosin, which is called the CARE PWS study or um, carbitosin safety and efficacy study in PWS patients. Um, so as disclosures, I'm uh, an employee of Levo Therapeutics. My name is Davis Ryman. Um, and uh, I think this cartoon of me here was made before COVID when my haircut wasn't quite as bad, but I'm doing uh, the best I can um, as we all are. And if you'd like any more um, information about our study or the previous phase two study that was completed in PWS with carbitosin, you can find additional information on our website at um, levotx.com. Okay. So I wanted to start by giving a little bit of introduction into what carbitosin is and kind of the uh, biology behind it being related to oxytocin and some of the reasons that have motivated us to um, continue developing it as a potential treatment for uh, symptoms um, suffered by PWS patients. So as I'll get to in a little bit, uh, carbitosin is what's called a oxytocin analog. So it's a um, molecule that's designed to be very similar to a normal hormone present in the body called oxytocin. So uh, you might have heard of oxytocin before, um, at, which is a normal hormone produced in the brain of humans and all other mammals that has a number of different um, important functions um, in, in behavior, including the control of appetite. It's what's called um, a, um, it, it's involved in the feeling of satiety or the normal sensation of being able to feel full after a meal or feel satiated as, as you normally would. Uh, it's also involved in a lot of different um, social and emotional behaviors, including anxiety, um, potentially autism spectrum symptoms, um, potentially obsessive compulsive symptoms. It's particularly involved in being important in the normal feeling of trust um, in bonding between um, mother and child and bonding between um, friends and family members or, or in any other social situation. Um, and particularly in the, the feeling of trust in general, it's, um, you might've seen it referred to as the love hormone in the media, but it's thought to be involved in a lot of um, calming or trust, um, trust enhancing um, functions. And those are a lot of things that can be missing or reduced in PWS patients if they feel a, a lack of calmness or trust, uh, particularly when um, situations are unexpectedly changed. They also definitely have problems with satiety or normal appetite. So taking all of these together, there's certainly a lot of reason to believe that oxytocin um, and related compounds could be a potential therapy to be explored in PWS patients. And building on that, there's also some significant research relating to oxytocin functioning in PWS patients specifically. So for example, it's been shown that uh, patients with PWS have a significantly lower number of oxytocin producing neurons or brain cells in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. You can see that here in this um, fluorescence microscope picture where the bright green dots are representing those oxytocin positive neurons and are significantly decreased in PWS patients going along with that um, apparent um, decrease in a lot of the normal functions of oxytocin that could be manifested in their symptoms. Um, so taking those things together, it's felt that um, oxytocin or related compounds could be very uh, potentially helpful as a potential treatment for PWS, thinking about it like a almost like a hormone replacement therapy type of approach if there's a decreased um, uh, amount of oxytocin function in PWS patients, hopefully replacing some of that um, as directly as we can with oxytocin or a related compound could be beneficial in a variety of those symptoms. So uh, as, you, as I think you heard a little bit about this morning, there have been a number of trials of oxytocin itself in patients with PWS. Um, and those have had in general some mixed results. Um, particularly there was one trial in Australia that didn't seem to show a benefit in behaviors and had shown some increased temper tantrums. And it was felt at that time that that might be because of what's called an off-target activity or off-target binding that oxytocin itself has. In other words, 
uh, if you give oxytocin itself, um, in addition to binding to the oxytocin receptors themselves, it also has um, various off-target bindings that you wouldn't want to other receptors in the brain, such as vasopressin receptors, and that it might have side effects relating to that nonspecific or off-target action. So relating to that, um, that also contributed to the rationale for the development of carbitocin, which I'll talk about now. So carbitocin is, like I mentioned earlier, what's called an oxytocin analog. In other words, a molecule that's designed to be very similar in its structure and very similar in its functions and behaviors to the, the oxytocin itself that I just talked about. Uh, however, carbitocin was designed to try to have two uh, principal important differences compared to oxytocin, uh, the one being that it has a significantly improved half-life. In other words, it can um, kind of hang around and remain active in the body for somewhat longer. Um, so it could potentially be dosed uh, um, about three times a day. Um, oxytocin itself has a very short half-life and might not very um, really hang around in the body and be able to act for very long after a single dose. So that's one difference. Another difference is the improved selectivity for binding specifically to oxytocin receptors. In other words, carbitocin was designed to try to have um, significantly less off-target binding or nonspecific binding to these other receptor types in the brain and primarily binds just very specifically to oxytocin receptors. So it's hoped that that might limit the uh, potential for off-target side effects relative to oxytocin. Um, so interestingly, there is a significant amount of clinical experience and history of the previous um, and currently ongoing use of carbitocin for a different purpose. So um, this intravenous form of carbitocin given as an injection is currently approved in over 90 countries outside the U.S., including Canada and most European countries. Um, and that's approved for a different use. It's to prevent excessive bleeding after a C-section or a cesarean birth. That's because one other action of oxytocin and carbitocin is to improve the uh, muscle tone in the uterus. And so it's been used um, for, for some years for that reason. Uh, I think it's been given to over 10 million women for that purpose. Um, and um, it's relatively uh, reassuring to have had that, that significant safety experience with clinical use. Um, however, of course, an intravenous um, injection wouldn't be suitable for an ongoing treatment. Um, for example, for PWS patients. So because of that uh, development of a intranasal form or a nasal spray form of carbitocin was initiated by Karen Pharmaceuticals uh, several years ago. Uh, so they did complete a series of phase one safety studies in healthy volunteers, which I won't have time to go uh, through today individually. Um, they did also conduct a completed phase two study of intranasal carbitocin in patients with PWS which was published um, last year and which we presented um, last year. Um, and I, I think the presentation, including that, is still available on the FPWR website if you'd like to look at that. But briefly, that phase two study um, had demonstrated some significant improvements in hyperphagia as well as obsessive compulsive symptoms and um, PWS symptoms in general in a shorter, smaller um, two-week study in PWS patients. So that was very encouraging and motivated us um, to conduct the phase three efficacy study in a larger number of PWS patients for a longer period of time, which is called the CARE PWS study. So that's what I'll be presenting on today. So um, as background to what the CARE PWS study involved, it was a phase three randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study. In other words, uh, during that placebo-controlled part of it, neither the participants or us at Vivo or the study doctors or caregivers knew what the, what the uh, participants were assigned to get. And it had uh, evaluated two different dose levels of the intranasal carbitocin, um, a 9.6 milligram per dose level and a 3.2 milligram dose um, per dose level, um, which were given three times per, di um, per day before meals as a nasal spray. Um, and those were compared with a matching placebo or an identical nasal spray that didn't contain any carbitocin. Um, and it was blinded to all participants what um, assignment was, was received. So the study had originally planned to enroll a target of 175 participants with PWS, and um, it included participants who had gen genetically confirmed diagnosis of PWS who were aged 7 through 18. That included anyone who was um, up to 19 years of age at the time of enrollment. So there were some people that turned 19 during the study. 
Um, the, the overall design of the study, which I'll show on a diagram in the next slide, uh, was that there was an initial eight week placebo control period where people were randomly assigned to one of these three dose groups that I talked about. Um, following that, all participants transitioned to receive active carbitocin during an additional 56 week long term follow up period. And then um, they had the option after that to continue in an ongoing extension period, which is still continuing. So a total of 24 study sites, 19 in the US, four in Canada, and one in Australia had enrolled patients in the study. So here's a diagram of the um, study design that I talked about earlier. In other words, um, on entry into the study, people were randomly assigned to one of these three groups, um, one being the 3.2 milligram dose group, one being the 9.6 milligram dose group, and one being the placebo dose group. And after that eight week controlled period, um, the, the behavioral ratings were again measured and assessed and people that were previously on placebo had been randomly assigned to continue in the long-term follow-up period on either the 3.2 milligram or 9.6 milligram dose um, um, during the long-term follow-up period. And then after that, people were allowed to enter a optional extension period um, and continue to receive carbitocin. So as we all know, there were a lot of unexpected and really unprecedented impacts from this, this COVID-19 pandemic that we're all still dealing with. Um, so because of the potential impacts of the pandemic on how the study would be able to be conducted, it could have a, a number of impacts on the, the behaviors and symptoms that people with PWS in the study are experiencing and also had um, a number of um, there were also a number of restrictions on whether um, in-person study visits could be completed at many of our sites at various times. So because of those factors, uh, the study unfortunately had to be close to enrollment earlier than anticipated. So only 130 of the previously planned 175 participants were enrolled um, by that time. And then to ensure accurate assessment of the study treatment and its effects on behaviors kind of in a balanced way, the FDA agreed to Google's proposal to conduct the efficacy analysis based on the data collected through March 1st. So of those patients enrolled, this what's called the primary analysis set or PAS had the valuable um, efficacy data or, or information on the effects on behaviors and PWS symptoms for 119 um, participants in total. So this is showing patients' entry into the study. Um, as I mentioned, patients were randomly assigned to the three dose groups in equal proportions, being the 3.2 milligram group, um, 9.6 milligram group, and the matching placebo. There were 130 patients who were randomized and dosed with one of those three, um, or, uh, one of those three uh, investigation products. The randomization was relatively equal with about 43 to 44 participants in each of the arm. Um, and the majority of those were able to be um, included in the primary analysis set. Um, and then after the week eight period, um, patients previously on placebo moved to one of the two active arms and have continued on those doses. So this is a summary of what's called the baseline demographics, or just what were the characteristics of each of the groups as the participants enrolled and entered into the study. So you can see the numbers and percentage um, here for each of the randomized groups. In general, um, our conclusion was that participants in each group had generally very similar characteristics when entering the study, which was, was good. There was perhaps a very slightly um, higher number of female patients in 3.2, but not very significantly. Um, and um, most of the other characteristics were quite similar between each of the randomly assigned groups. So to evaluate efficacy or the potential effectiveness of the treatment in controlling a variety of symptoms of PWS, the study evaluated a um, variety of different questionnaire-based measures or what's called study endpoints. So for each of the dose groups, the study primarily evaluated uh, hyperphagia symptoms and behaviors using what you're probably familiar with, uh, a scale called the Hyperphagia Questionnaire for Clinical Trials, or HQCT, which is a caregiver-completed questionnaire uh, measuring the severity of their child's hyperphagia symptoms. Uh, we also assessed what's uh, um, obsessive and compulsive symptoms and behaviors using a different scale called the Children's Dale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, or the CYBOX. Um, and this involves a um, um, a checklist of a large number of different potential obsessive and compulsive behaviors, such as repetitive questioning, um, um, hoarding, um, 
various ritual behaviors, um, rigidity, and other, other behaviors. It was primarily developed for obsessive compulsive behavior disorder, um, but many PWS patients have similar symptoms that are a, a significant problem for them. Um, so since the 9.6 milligram dose was the only dose tested in the previously completed phase two study that I mentioned earlier, that was um, tested as what's called the primary endpoint or the statistical test that's performed first. Um, and then the 3.2 milligram dose juice a dose group was tested versus placebo as the first secondary endpoint or the endpoint that's statistically tested next. Um, additional endpoints or questionnaires that we assessed and evaluated during the study included an assessment of PWS specific anxiety and distress behaviors. So this was using a new questionnaire uh, called the PADQ or the PWS anxiety and distress questionnaire. Um, this was developed with some significant help from the FPWR, which had been involved in, in validation studies of it that have recently been completed. So we'd like to um, thank them again for, for that contribution to the PWS research community. Um, and we also included a global overall assessment of PWS symptoms overall using a scale called the CGIC or the Clinical Global Impression of Change. So this allows the study doctor to independently rate how much do they feel that the PWS symptoms overall had improved or worsened um, from um, the start of the study. So here are the top line results showing the change in the HQCT um, or hyperphagia questionnaire scores for each of the study groups. Um, you can see the placebo group in gray, the 3.2 milligram dose group in bright orange, the 9.6 milligram dose group in blue, and then a pooled analysis of all um, carbitocin patients, in other words, the 3.2 and 9.6 um, patients pooled together. Um, and then this shows their change in hyperphagia questionnaire scores from baseline to week age, so through the end of that placebo control period. So as you can see, even patients on placebo did show some um, reduction, which is attributed to the placebo effect. Um, this was relatively limited, perhaps thanks to um, we had some placebo response uh, reduction training, which helped the caregivers and participants to try to be really as objective as possible. So we're really appreciative of all their work in trying to give a very objective and accurate answer. And that did allow a, um, a significant um, appreciable difference to be observed between the placebo group reduction and the 3.2 milligram dose group reduction, which had had a decrease in score of 5.37 points um, from baseline to week eight. The 9.6 milligram dose group also showed a decrease, which was again um, larger than in the placebo group, but it was somewhat less as a 3.44 um, point reduction from uh, baseline to week eight. And then the combined group showing a reduction of about 4.4 points from baseline to week eight. So this is a summary of the results of some statistical tests compared to placebo and showing whether or not various endpoints had numerically improved or not from baseline to week eight. I'll show some more detailed um, line charts in a few slides that will let you see the um, decrease or improvement in each of these um, measures throughout the study as it, as it continued. But uh, this is focusing on the baseline to week eight data um, and showing the, uh, whether or not each of these groups had an improvement compared to placebo, and then whether or not that was statistically significant as judged by a what's called a p-value of less than 0 0.05. So as you can see, um, actually most of these endpoints did have a numeric improvement relative to placebo from baseline to week eight. Um, the 3.2 milligram dose group did show statistical significance as defined by a p-value of less than 0.05, um, and most of these measures, with the exception of the Cybox, um, the 9.6 milligram dose group did show improvements relative to placebo, but those did not reach statistical significance um, and showed improvements in each of these except for the PAG-Q. Um, so I can show in the coming slides, the, uh, this shows that um, the improvements overall appeared to have continued and even um, slightly improved with further with time. This shows the total change from baseline to week 16 um, for each study group uh, in the HQTCT score. So in patients that started out on placebo and then got 3.2 milligrams, they had a total reduction of about 9.7 points by that week 16 time point. And patients that started on 3.2 milligrams and remained on that through week 16 
they had a decrease of about 10.85 points from baseline to week 16. Um, and in the group that had uh, started on placebo and changed to 9.6, they had decreased by about nine points by the week 16 time point. The patients that had started on 9.6 and remained on that also had a decrease of about um, 9.2 points um, through week 16. So although, as I showed in the previous slide, the statistical analysis um, did reach significance um, really only for that 3.2 milligram dose group, the um, patients in both those groups did appear to have numeric reductions with time that appeared to be somewhat similar in general. So here's a line chart showing the overall improvements with time for each dose group. Um, perhaps it's a little hard to see, but you can see the um, individual dose groups by, by colors at the bottom. Um, the uh, general conclusion was that uh, with time, patients appear to have had a sustained decrease from their baseline scores and the HQCT total score. That appeared to be somewhat similar um, as time progressed between the 3.2 and 9.6 milligram groups. Um, and it appears to have been sustained um, throughout that long-term follow-up period. Uh, as an important caveat, the long-term follow-up period is still ongoing um, and participants remain blinded as to which group they were initially assigned to. But uh, this is of the results of the analyses of the currently available data um, that we currently have, although that study is continuing. Um, these are the results uh, from that CYBOX or the Children's Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. As I mentioned, this was an endpoint that didn't reach statistically um, significant criteria when it was tested versus placebo. However, um, in looking at the data, there do appear to have been some numeric reductions in both of the dose groups that appear to have continued and perhaps um, increased with time um, with a reduction from their baseline uh, Cybox total score. And this is the data from the PADQ or the um, PWS Anxiety and Distress Questionnaire um, developed with the PWR, as I mentioned. So this did reach significance um, in the eight-week placebo control period for the 3.2 milligram dose group. And in looking at people's longitudinal um, trends and changes with time, it also appears to have had um, a significant or sustained trend for a decrease in, in PADQ score or a decrease in anxiety as measured by, by PADQ, which appears to have been sustained with time um, using the data that we have so far. So to summarize the efficacy data uh, that we have, but we believe the care PWS study supports that intranasal carbitocin appears to reduce hyperphagia and anxiety and distress behaviors in PWS, and that there appear to have been maintenance um, of these improvements over time in the long-term follow-up period of the study. Um, although the 3.2 milligram dose was not originally chosen as the primary endpoint, it nonetheless um, did achieve this uh, significant improvement in hyperphagia during the eight-week placebo control period of the study. Uh, and there was also an internally consistent effect that was observed with that 3.2 milligram dose groups across multiple other measures of PWS symptoms, including measurement of PWS anxiety and distress behaviors as measured by the PADQ scale, and measurement of the overall PWS symptom severity or overall change in PWS symptoms using that CGI or clinical global impression scale um, and clinical global impression of severity scale. Um, and in general, the improvements of PWS symptoms appear to have been sustained with time over the 64-week long-term follow-up period across both of the dose groups. So this is moving on to the, uh, the safety results from the study and safety data from the study. Um, this is a table of what's called treatment emergent adverse events, or TEAEs. Um, in other words, all potential um, adverse events or potential side effects that were observed in greater than or more than 5% of study participants in any treatment group during that initial eight-week placebo controlled period. And then you can see them here broken down by the treatment group um, that people were on when they encountered or reported that event, um, placebo 3.2 milligram dose group, 9.6 milligram dose group, or the combined um, group of all carbitocin patients. Um, and then we'll see the total number of events um, to the left and in parentheses, the percent of patients within that dose group that had had the event. So the most commonly reported event um, in this portion of the study was flushing. So this is a transient um, sensation of 
warmth and redness, in other words, feeling flushed and looking flushed, um, which can involve the face or arms or the, the trunk or the chest or the body generally. Um, this has been generally uh, short lasting and um, resolving on its own within about the first 15 minutes after a dose. This was, um, in looking at all of these events overall, the one that did have a clear relationship with the dose and with the study drug. So this happened in about 20% of patients on that highest dose of 9.6 milligrams, about 14% of patients on the 3.2 milligram dose, and zero patients in the placebo group. So that was really the one that had had a clear um, seeming relationship uh, with dose in this period. Uh, the second most common adverse event was headache. In the previously reported phase two study, that had been reported in 30% of patients in the placebo group and the active group. Um, in this study, it was reported in about 12.6% of patients on carbitocin and about 7% of uh, patients on placebo. Um, other events that were uh, encountered at lower rates included um, nasal discomfort. For the most part, that was mild and also transient or short-lasting. Um, it happened slightly more frequently in the carbitocin group at about 5.7% versus 2.3% in the placebo group. Um, there were a few events of diarrhea, um, a few events of apostaxis. This is um, a fancy Greek word for nosebleeds. This was also generally mild to moderate in um, severity and was um, self-limited or resolved without further problems. Um, there was a few events of pyrexia or fever or upper respiratory tract infections, um, such as a, a cold or, or viral infection involving the, the nose or chest. And here are the safety results from the long-term follow-up period, again, showing all um, treatment emergent adverse events that occurred in 5% or more of study participants. Um, here, the flushing was less common. We reported it didn't reach that 5% threshold, so we believe that might be something that tends to reduce with time as people um, get more accustomed to taking the treatment. Um, we did, again, have um, headache reported at a moderate rate, which didn't appear to be significantly different between the dose groups. There were a few events of nasopharyngitis. Again, this could be like a common cold or upper respiratory infection, um, pyrexia or fever, uh, epistaxis or nosebleed, diarrhea, and then a few events of what's called gynecomastia or a breast blood development in boys. That was reported at a few patients in one of our study sites. And in most cases, that was mild to moderate in severity. Uh, and several of them had resolved by the end of the study. So additional safety data that was monitored during the study included a panel of standard clinical laboratory assessments, um, including a complete blood count, a comprehensive metabolic panel, regulation panel, and urinalysis. We also monitored electrocardiograms, or ECGs, and patients' vital signs, including their blood pressure and heart rate, um, respiratory rate, um, and temperature at study visits. So review of this additional safety data by uh, us at Vivo and by our independent data monitoring committee uh, have unfortunately identified no other notable trends or apparent safety signals um, that appear to be associated with the drug. So our overall conclusions from this study is that um, taking, to, taking this together with the previously supported phase two study results in PWS, um, these study results indicate that intranasal carbitocin uh, appears to be effective in reducing um, some of the key symptoms of PWS. And together with the phase two and previously completed phase one studies, the data overall do support that intranasal carbitocin appears to be generally safe and well tolerated. Um, so we owe and our independent data monitoring committee have agreed that the overall data seem to support continued advancement of the 3.2 milligram dose is consistent um, considering that it was the lowest effective dose that was studied um, and um, appeared to have broadly similar safety results between the dose groups. So um, going forward, we will be working closely with regulatory authorities to try to bring uh, carbitose into patients as quickly as possible. And um, we look forward to taking your questions. But um, I'd like to close with just sending out a special um, heartfelt thank you just to all the participants and caregivers in our studies. So we know that it really takes a lot of investment to participate in a long and uh, detailed study like this. And uh, this is a, a shot from our wall when we used to work uh, in the office. We're currently working from home, but had this office just north of Chicago and would hang up one of these paper butterflies each time a patient had enrolled um, just to, to um, symbolize and recognize their commitment. 
So um, we definitely like to say thank you to each of our participants and caregivers, to each of our dedicated study investigators at over 20 study sites. Um, they each put a lot of work and thought and effort into this trial. Um, and also to FPWR for all of your um, help both with the PADQ development and in organizing all the PWS walks when many of us went to some of those walks and connected with uh, potential trial participants there. So we're thankful to each of you for um, all of your help throughout this um, effort. Okay, so thanks very much, Susan. I'll look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Davis. We really appreciate you coming back to the community. So many of us were vested in this study and others, it's great that we're being able to hear directly from Levo um, as to the results of the study and next steps. I know we promised a 30 minute session, but we've got a few questions I'd like to make sure that we address. Um, so if we could take just a couple more minutes of your time, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. Uh, the first question that came in was in regards to genetic subtypes. Um, was there a difference in the response to the drug dependent on whether you were UPD or deletion? Now we did uh, look at that as one of what's called our, um, our sensitivity analysis with our statistician. And um, based on the data we have, there didn't appear to be a significant difference in response between people that had a deletion versus a unicranial disomy. So um, our belief is that it seemed to be similarly effective for each of those categories. Okay. Uh, the next study is in regards to the primary versus the secondary endpoint. So as you stated in the study, the primary endpoint was the 9.6 dose. The secondary endpoint was, was statistically significant in showing benefits to the patients. What's the path forward? Um, will you be able to apply to, for a new drug indication using the secondary endpoint or will another study be required? Well, I mean, that's, that's a very excellent question. Um, so as, as you probably know, the unusual um, drug development um, things are very focused on the primary endpoints. But um, in our situation, we, um, there's, there's a lot um, often more flexibility in orphan disorders, particularly with, with a lot of unmet medical need and in unusual situations. I think like we encountered with the trial basically having to be cut short due to the pandemic. Um, and with additional um, um, factors such as the long-term follow-up data seeming to show um, later decreases from baseline that were similar between the dose groups. So there's definitely a lot of complexity to that situation, but our um, conclusion and our belief is that the data are supportive of efficacy um, together with the previously conducted phase two studies. So we're definitely planning to put that all together into a detailed data package to discuss with the FDA and make the, the, the best case that we can um, in support of those arguments. Um, but of course, the, the, um, the outcome of that will be up to the agency. So we'll, we'll just try to present the data as thoroughly um, and accurately as, as we can and discuss with them um, the next steps um, and are hopeful um, that they'll, they'll um, see the evidence of efficacy that we believe is there. Thank you. Can you give us a general idea of timeline? So when might the FDA receive an application? When might they come back with um, a response? And at what point might this be able to be accessed through prescription? Mm -hmm. So I can probably only speak to the first part of that because it's the part that's in our control is when are we gonna um, communicate with them? And we're actually in the process of that right now. I think all of us at Levo have had um, a number of meetings putting together these informa information packages for a, a, a pre-NDA meeting and discussion with the and FDA. So this was an international study with participants from several European countries and Australia participating, correct? Or it was Canada, well, the US, yeah, Australia? It was actually Canada, US, and Australia. Canada, US, Australia. Okay, thank you. So are there, are, will applications be made to those countries as well, or is this strictly a US application at this point? Yeah, and no, we are planning to um, also approach Health Canada, which is the Canadian um, regulator, and the TGA, which is the Australian regulator. Um, as well, yes. Um, how about ages of people who will be able to get prescriptions? This was a largely pediatric study, but it did include some 18 year olds. Will adults be able to access this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another good question. And again, one that kind of does hinge on the regulatory discussions. Um, as you mentioned, we did enroll patients who were seven through 18, you know, including basically everyone that was up to um, 19 years of old at study entry. So there were some that turned 19 um, while participating in the study. 
We did also do some sensitivity analyses similar to that analysis by genetic subtype um, using age, and there didn't seem to be a significant effect of age. So our, our belief is that it seemed to be um, about as effective across the age range. So our, our belief is that it's likely effective for a broad range of patients, and we'll try to make the case to the agency that it could be generally applicable across the age range, but we'll have to have that discussion with regulators and the decision would be up to them. Sure. And um, last question is in regards to insurance. Of course, if a drug comes on the market, our families are very interested in being able to have access to it. What can we expect as far as insurance coverage? Will it be covered right away? Will steps need to be taken in order to get it covered? Yes, so um, based on the, the conversations with the regulators, if it looks like this will be um, approvable in a short period of time, we'll certainly try to engage with payers and insurers and do the best we can to try to ensure that it is um, something that will be covered by them um, by the time of launch. Again, it's something that is not in our own control, but we'll do the utmost that we can to try to make that happen. Sure. Thank you so much, Davis, for taking time out of your day to come and chat with us. It was wonderful to be, again to be able to see the results. Um, I hope that Davis was able to answer most of the questions. I know that we all have a lot of questions because this is a very exciting moment for us. We've never had, you know, we, in the last 20 years, we haven't gotten to this point where we have a phase three study ready for um, a new drug indication. So again, thank you for answering our questions. And we look forward, of course, to hearing more um, from Levo as details come out. So right. well, thanks. thanks again, Susan. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. You too.